of contemporary financial capitalism. He has uh, worked from, from the daily management of quantum fund because he determined to devote more time to philanthropy, to donating. He donated up to date uh, um, a lot of money in philanthropic activities to favor the democratic tran transition in Eastern and Central uh, Europe uh, countries. More recently, uh, he uh, was one of the founders and financiers of uh, uh, INET for New Economic Thinking. It's uh, an institute uh, to stimulate uh, new economic uh, thinking. He believes that uh, the crisis uh, which started in uh, uh, 2007 imposes a rethinking of economic theories. You have the floor. Th thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, ever since the crash of 2008, there has been a widespread recognition, both among economists and the general public, that economic theory has failed. But there is no consensus on the causes and the extent of that failure. I believe that the failure is more profound than generally realized. It goes back to the foundations of economic theory. Economics tried to model itself on Newtonian physics. It sought to establish universally and timelessly valid laws governing reality. But economics is a social science, and there is a fundamental difference between the natural and social sciences. Social phenomena have thinking participants who base their decisions on imperfect knowledge. That's what economic theory tried to ignore. Scientific method needs an independent criterion by which the truth or validity of its theories can be judged. Natural phenomena constitute such a criterion. Social phenomena don't. That's because natural phenomena consist of facts that unfold independently of any statements that, are, that relate to them. The facts then serve as objective evidence by which the validity of scientific theories can be judged. That's what has enabled natural science to produce amazing results. Social events, by contrast, have thinking participants who have a will of their own. They are not detached observers, but engaged decision makers whose decisions greatly influence the course of events. Therefore, the events don't constitute an independent criterion by which participants can decide whether their views are valid. In the absence of an independent criterion, people have to base their decisions not on knowledge, but on an inherently biased and to greater or, less or lesser extent distorted interpretation of reality. Their lack of perfect knowledge or fallibility introduces an element of indeterminacy into the course of events that is absent when the events relate to the behavior of inanimate objects. The resulting uncertainty hinders the social sciences in producing laws similar to Newton's physics. Economics 
which became the most influential of the social sciences, sought to remove this handicap by taking an axiomatic approach, similar to Euclid's geometry. But Euclid's axioms closely resembled reality, while the theory of rational expectations and the efficient market hypothesis became far removed from it. Up to a point, the axiomatic approach worked. For instance, the theory of perfect competition postulated perfect knowledge. But the postulate worked only as long as it was applied to the exchange of physical goods. When it came to production as distinct from exchange, or to the use of money and credit, the postulate became untenable because the decisions involved the future, and the future can't be known until it has actually occurred. I'm not well qualified to criticize the theory of, of uh, rational expectations and the efficient market hypothesis because as a market participant, I considered them so unrealistic that I never bothered to study them. <laughs> that is an indictment in itself, but I shall leave a detailed critic of these theories to others. Instead, I should like to put before you a radically different approach to financial markets. It was inspired by Karl Popper, who taught me that people's interpretation of reality never quite corresponds to reality itself. This led me to study the relationship between the two. I found a two-way connection between the participants' thinking and the situations in which they participate. On the one hand, people seek to understand the situation. That's the cognitive function. <clears throat> on the other, they seek to make an impact on the situation. I call that the causative or manipulative function. The two functions connect the thinking agents and the situations in which they participate in opposite directions. In the cognitive function, the situation is supposed to determine the participants' views. In the causative function, the participants' views are supposed to determine the outcome. When both functions are at work at the same time, they interfere with each other. The two functions form a circular relationship or feedback loop. I call that feedback loop reflexivity. In a reflexive situation, the participants' views can't correspond to reality because reality is not something independently given. It is contingent on the participants' views and decisions. The decisions, in turn, can't be based on knowledge alone. They must contain some bias or guesswork relating to the future because the future is contingent on the participants' decisions. Fallibility and reflexivity are tied together like Siamese twins. Without fallibility, there would be no reflexivity. Although the opposite is not the case, people's understanding would be imperfect even if in the absence of reflexivity. Of the two twins, fallibility is the firstborn. Together, they ensure both a convergence between the parties, uh, sorry, they ensure both a divergence between the participants' views of reality and the actual state of affairs and a divergence between the participants' expectations and the actual outcome. Obviously, I didn't discover reflexivity. Other, others 
had recognized it before me, often under a different name. Robert Merton wrote about self-fulfilling prophecies and the Ben Bagler effect. Keynes compared financial markets to a beauty contest where the participants had to guess who would be the most popular choice. Uh, by, by, but starting from, flexi from fallibility and reflexivity, I focused on a problem area, uh, namely the role of misconceptions and misunderstandings in shaping the, the course of events that mainstream economics tried to ignore. This has made my interpretation of reality more realistic than the prevailing paradigm. <clears throat> Among other things, I developed a model of a boom-bust process or bubble, which is endogenous to financial markets, not the result of external shocks. According to my theory, financial bubbles are not a purely psychological phenomenon. They have two components, a trend that actually prevails in reality and a misinterpretation of that trend. A bubble can develop when the feedback is initially positive in the sense that both the trend and its biased interpretation are mutually reinforced. Eventually, the gap between the trend and the prevailing bias grows so wide that it becomes unsustainable. After a, a twilight period, both the bias and the trend are reversed and reinforce each other in the opposite direction. B bubbles are usually asymmetric in shape. Booms develop slowly, but the bust tends to be sudden and devastating. That's due to the use of leverage. Price declines precipitate the forced liquidation of leveraged positions. Well-formed financial bubbles always follow this pattern, but the magnitude and duration of each phase is unpredictable. Moreover, the process can be aborted at any stage so that well-formed financial bubbles occur rather infrequently. At any moment of time, there are myriads of feedback loops at work, some of which are positive, others negative. They interact each other, with each other, producing the irregular price, price patterns that prevail most of the time. But on the rare occasions that bubbles develop to their full potential, they tend to overshadow all other influences in the market. <clears throat> According to my theory, financial markets may just as soon produce bubbles as tend towards equilibrium. Since bubbles disrupt financial markets, history has been punctuated by financial crises. Each crisis provokes a regulatory response. That's how central banking and financial regulations have evolved in step with the markets themselves. Bubbles occur only intermittently but the interplay between markets and regulators is ongoing. And since both market participants and regulators act on the basis of imperfect knowledge, the interplay between them is ref reflexive. Mo moreover, reflexivity and fallibility are not confined to the financial markets. They also characterize other spheres of social life, particularly politics. Indeed, in light of the undergoing interaction between markets and regulators, 
it's quite misleading to study financial markets in isolation. Behind the invisible hand of the market lies the visible hand of politics. Instead of pursuing timeless laws and models, we ought to study events in their time-bound context. My interpretation of financial markets differs from the prevailing paradigm in many ways. I emphasize the role of fallibility, that is to say misunderstandings and misconceptions in shaping the course of history. And I treat bubbles as largely unpredictable. The direction and its eventual reversal are predictable. Uh, the magnitude and duration of the various phases is not. I contend that by taking fallibility as the starting point, uh, 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 I can make my conceptual framework more realistic, but at a price. The idea that laws or models of universal validity can predict the future must be abandoned. Until recently, my interpretation of financial markets was either ignored or dismissed by academic econ economists. All this has changed since the crash of 2008. Reflexivity became recognized, but with the exception of imperfect knowledge economics, the foundations of economic theory have not been subjected to the profound rethinking that I consider necessary. Reflexivity has been accommodated by speaking of multiple equilibria instead of a single one. But that's not enough. The fallibility of market participants, regulators, and economists must also be recognized. A truly dynamic situation can't be understood by studying multiple equilibria. We need to study the process of change. change. <clears throat> the Euro crisis is particularly instructive in this regard. It demonstrates the role of misconceptions and the lack of understanding in shaping the course of history. The authorities didn't understand the nature of the crisis. They thought of it as a fiscal problem, while it's more a banking problem and a problem of competitiveness. And they applied the wrong remedy. You can't reduce the debt burden by shrinking the economy, only by growing your way out of it. The crisis is still growing because of a failure to understand the dynamics of social change. Policy measures that could have worked at one point in time uh, were no longer sufficient by the time they were applied. Since the Euro crisis is currently exerting an overwhelming influence on the global economy, I shall devote the rest of my talk to it. I must start with a warning. The discussion will take us beyond the confines of economic theory into politics and the dynamics of social change. But my conceptual framework, based on the twin pillars of fallibility and reflexivity, still applies. Reflexivity doesn't always manifest itself in the form of bubbles. The reflexive interplay between imperfect markets and imperfect authorities goes on all the time, while bubbles occur only infrequently. This is a rare occasion when the interaction ex exerts such a large influence that it casts its shadow on the, glo on the entire global economy. How could this happen? My answer is that there is a bubble involved, 
after all, but it's not a financial, but a political one. It relates to the political evolution of the European Union, and it has led me to the conclusion that the Euro crisis threatens to destroy the European Union itself. Let me explain. I contend that the European Union itself is like a bubble. In the boom phase, the EU was what psychoanalyst David Tuckett calls a fantastic object, unreal but immensely attractive. It was the embodiment of an open society, an association of nations founded on the principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, in which no nation or nationality would have a dominant position. The process of integration was spearheaded by a small group of far-sighted statesmen who practiced what Karl Popper called piecemeal social engineering. They recognized that perfection is unattainable, so they set limited objectives and firm timelines and then mobilized the political will for a small step forward, knowing full well that when they achieved it, its inadequacy would become apparent and require a further step. The process fed on its own success very much like a financial bubble. That's how the coal and steel community was gradually transformed into the European Union, step by step. Germany used to be in the, in the forefront of the effort. When the Soviet empire started to disintegrate, German leaders realized that reunification was possible only in the context of a more united Europe, and they were willing to make considerable sacrifices to achieve it. When it came to bargaining, they were willing to contribute a little more and take a little less than the others, thereby facilitating agreement. At that time, German statesmen used to assert that Germany has no independent foreign policy, only a European one. The process culminated with the Maastricht Treaty and the introduction of the Euro. It was followed by a period of digestion, which after the crash of 2008, turned into a process of disintegration. The first step was taken by Germany when after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, Angela Merkel declared that the virtual guarantee extended to other financial institutions should come from each country acting separately, not by Europe acting jointly. It took financial markets more than a year to realize the implications of that declaration, showing that they are not perfect. The Maastricht Treaty was fundamentally flawed, demonstrating the fallibility of the authorities. Its main weakness was well known to its architects. It established a monetary union without a political union. The architects believed, however, that when the need arose, the political will could be generated to take the necessary steps forward towards a political uni union. <clears throat> but the euro also had some other defects of which the architects were unaware and which are not fully understood even today. In retrospect, it's now clear that the main source of trouble is that the member states of the euro have surrendered to the European Central Bank their rights to create fiat money. They didn't realize what that entails, and neither did the European authorities. When the euro was introduced, the regulators allowed banks 
to buy unlimited amounts of government bonds without setting aside any equity capital. And the central bank accepted all government bonds at its discount window on equal terms. That made it advantageous to commercial banks to ac accumulate the bonds of the weaker euro members in order to earn a few extra basis points. That's what caused interest rates to converge, which in turn caused competitiveness to diverge. Germany, struggling with the bur burdens of reunification, undertook structural reforms and became more competitive. Other countries enjoyed housing and consumption booms on the back of cheap credit, which made them less competitive. Then came the crash of 2008, which created conditions that were far removed from those prescribed by the Maastricht Treaty. Many governments had to shift bank liabilities onto their own balance sheets and engage in massive deficit spending. These countries found themselves in the position of a third world country that had become heavily indebted in a currency that it did not control. Due to the divergence in economic performance, Europe became divided between creditor and debtor countries. This is having far-reaching political implications to which I will re revert. It took some time for the financial markets to discover that government bonds, which had been considered riskless, are subject to speculative attack and may actually default. But when they did, risk premiums rose dramatically. This rendered commercial banks whose balance sheets were loaded with those bonds potentially insolvent. And that constituted the two main components of the problem confronting us today, a sovereign debt crisis and a banking crisis which are closely interlinked. The, Euro, the Eurozone authorities uh, are now repeating what the international financial uh, authorities often did in the global financial system. There is a close parallel between the Euro crisis and the international banking crisis that erupted in 1982. Then the international financial authorities did whatever was necessary to protect the banking system. They inflicted hardship on the periphery in order to, pro to protect the center. Now Germany and the other credit countries are unknowingly playing the same role. The details differ, but the idea is the same. The creditors are in effect shifting all the burden of adjustment onto the debtor countries and avoiding their own responsibility for the imbalances. Interestingly, the terms center and periphery have kept into usage almost unnoticed. Just as in the 1980s, all the blame and burden is falling on the periphery, and the responsibility of the center has never been properly acknowledged. Yet, the Euro crisis, in the Euro crisis, the responsibility of the center is even greater than it was in 1982. The center is responsible for designing a flawed system, enacting flawed treaties, pursuing flawed policies, and always doing too little too late. In the 1980s, Latin America suffered a lost decade. A similar fate now awaits Europe. 
That's the responsibility that Germany and the other creditor countries need to acknowledge. But there is no sign of this happening. The European authorities had little understanding of, of what was happening. They were prepared to deal with fiscal problems, but only Greece qualified as a fiscal crisis. The rest of Europe suffered from a banking crisis and a divergence in competitiveness, which gave rise to a balance of payments crisis. The authorities didn't even understand the nature of the problem, let alone see a solution. So they tried to buy time. Usually that works. Financial panics subside and the authorities realize a profit on their intervention. But not this time, because the financial problems were reinforced by a process of political disintegration. While the European Union was being created, the leadership was in the forefront of further integration. But after the outbreak of the financial crisis, the authorities became defendants of the status quo. Uh, this has forced all those who consider the status quo unsustainable or intolerable into an anti-European posture. That's the political dynamic that makes the disintegration of the European Union just as self-reinforcing as its creation has been. That's the political bubble I was talking about. At the outset of the uh, crisis, a break breakup of the euro was inconceivable. The assets and liabilities denominated in a common currency were so intermingled that a breakup would have led to an uncontrollable meltdown. But as the crisis progressed, the financial system has been progressively reordered along national lines. This trend has gathered momentum in recent months. The long-term refinancing operation, uh, or LTRO, uh, undertaken by the European Central Bank, enabled Spanish and Italian banks to engage in a very profitable and low-risk arbitrage by buying the bonds of their own countries. And other investors have been actively divesting themselves of the sovereign debt of the periphery countries. If this continued for a few more years, a breakup of the euro would become possible without a meltdown. The omelette could be unscrambled, but it would leave the central banks of the creditor countries with large claims against the central banks of the debtor countries which would be difficult to collect. This is due to an arcane problem in the euro clearing system called Target 2. In contrast to the clearing system of the Federal Reserve, which is settled annually, uh, Target 2 accumulates the imbalances. This didn't create a problem as long as the interbank system was functioning because the banks settled the imbalances among themselves through the interbank market. But the, inter the interbank market has started uh, properly functioning since 2007, and the banks relied increasingly on the target system. And since the summer of two, two, uh, 2011, there has been uh, an increase in capital flight from the weaker countries. So the imbalances have grown exponentially. By the end of March this year, the Bundesbank alone had claims of some 660 billion euros against the central banks of the periphery countries. The Bundesbank uh, 
has become aware of the potential danger. It is now engaged in a campaign against the indefinite expansion of the money supply and it has started taking measures to limit the losses it would sustain in case of a breakup. This is creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once the Bundesbank starts guarding against a, a breakup, everybody will have to do the same. And this is already happening. Financial institutions are increasingly reordering their European exposure along national lines, just in case the region splits apart. Uh, banks give preference to shedding assets outside their national borders, and risk managers try to match assets and liabilities within national borders rather than within the Eurozone as a whole. The indirect effect of this asset liability matching is to re reinforce the deleveraging process and to reduce the availability of credit, particularly to the small and medium enterprises which are the main source of employment. So the crisis is getting ever deeper. Tensions in the financial markets have risen to new highs, as shown by the historic low yield on bonds. Even more telling is the fact that the yield on British 10-year government bonds has never been lower in its 300-year history, while the risk premium on Spanish, Spanish bonds is at a new high. The real economy is, uh, of the Eurozone is declining, while Germany is still booming. This means that the divergence is getting wider. The political and social dynamics are also working towards disintegration. Public opinion, as expressed in recent election results, is increasingly opposed to austerity. And this trend is likely to grow until the policy is re reversed. So something has to give. In my judgment, the authorities <coughs> have a three months window during which they could still correct their mistakes and reverse the current trends. By the authorities, I mean mainly the German government and the Bundesbank, because in a crisis, the creditors are in the driver's seat and nothing can be done without German support. I expect that the Greek public will be sufficiently frightened by the prospect of expulsion from the European Union that it will give a narrow majority of seats to a coalition that is ready to abide by the current agreement. But no government can meet the conditions so that the Greek crisis is liable to come to a climax in the fall. By that time, the German economy also will be weakening so that Chancellor Merkel will find it even more difficult than today to persuade the German public to accept additional European responsibilities. Uh, uh, that is why I'm talking about a, a three months window. Correcting the mistakes and reversing the trends would require some extraordinary policy measures to bring condition back, conditions back uh, closer to normal and bring relief to the financial markets and the banking system. These measures must, however, conform to the existing treaties. The treaties could then be revised in a calmer atmosphere so that the current imbalances will not recur in the future. It's difficult, but not impossible, to design some extraordinary measures 
that would meet these tough requirements. They would have to tackle simultaneously the banking problem and the problem of excessive debt uh, because these problems are interlinked. Addressing one without the other, as in the past, will not work. Banks need a European deposit insurance scheme in order to stem the capital flight. They also need direct financing from the European stability mechanism, which has to go hand in hand with Eurozone-wide supervision and regulation. The heavily indebted countries need relief on their financing costs. There are various ways uh, to provide it, but they all need the active support of the Bundesbank and the German government. That's where the blockage is. The authorities are working feverishly to come up with a set of proposals in time for the European summit at the end of this month. Based on current uh, newspaper reports, the measures will propose, uh, that they will propose will co cover all the bases I have mentioned, but they will offer only the minimum on which the various parties can agree, while what is needed is a convincing commitment in order to reverse the trend. That means that measures will again offer some temporary relief, but the trends will continue. But we are at an inflection point. After the expiration of the three months window, the markets will continue to demand more, but the authorities will not be able to meet their demands. It's impossible to predict the eventual outcome. As mentioned before, the gradual reordering of the financial system along national lines could make an orderly breakup of the euro possible in a few years' time, and if it were not for the social and political dynamics, one could imagine a common market without a common, mar uh, without a common mar uh, currency. But the trends are clearly non-linear, and an earlier breakup is bound to be disorderly. It, almost, it would almost certainly lead to a collapse of the Schengen Treaty, the common market, and the European Union itself. It should be remembered that there is an exit mechanism for, for the European Union, but not for the Euro. Unenforceable claims and unsettled grievances would leave Europe worse off than it was at the outset when the project of a, European, of a united Europe was conceived. But the likelihood is that the Euro will survive because a breakup would be devastating not only for the periphery but also for Germany. It would leave Germany with large unenforceable claims against the periphery countries. The Bundesbank alone will have over a trillion euros of claims arising out of the target too by the end of this year, in addition to all the intergovernmental obligations and a return to the Deutschmark would likely price Germany out of its export markets, not to mention the political consequences. So Germany is likely to do what is necessary to preserve the euro, but nothing more. That would result in a eurozone dominated by Germany in which the divergence between the creditor and debtor countries would continue to widen, and the periphery would turn into permanently distressed areas, 
in need of constant transfer of payments. That would turn the European in, uh, Union into something very different from what it was when it was a fantastic object that fired people's imagination. It would be a German empire with the periphery as the hinterland. I believe most of us would find that objectionable, but I have a great deal of sympathy with Germany in its present predicament. The German public can't understand why a policy of structural reforms and fiscal austerity that worked for Germany a decade ago, ago will not work for Europe today. Germany then could enjoy an export-led recovery, but the Eurozone today is caught in a deflationary debt trap. The German public doesn't see any deflation at home. On the contrary, wages are rising and there are vacancies for skilled jobs which are eagerly snapped up by immigrants from other European countries. Re reluctance to invest abroad and the influx of flight capital are fueling a real estate boom. Exports may be slowing, but employment is still rising. In these circumstances, it would require an extraordinary effort by the German government to convince the German public to embrace, to embrace the extraordinary measures that would be necessary to reverse the current trend. And they have only a three-month window in which to do it. We need to do whatever we can to convince Germany to show leadership and preserve the European Union as the fantastic object that it used to be. The future of Europe depends on it. Thank you. I want to ask a couple of questions to Mr. Soros, and I'll do so in English. Then we'll have some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you raised a number of issues, and uh, as you were speaking, well, one cannot uh, help but thinking about history. You were born in Europe, and you moved to the U.S. because uh, of what uh, European history has been. And so we have two models, European history of the last century and the US that integrated politically and then financially through crisis. Uh, I'm thinking about the civil war, I'm thinking about the, the financial crisis in, in the early 20th century that led to the creation of the Federal Reserve and then 1929 uh, with the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, would you accept this parallel that Europe is integrating through crisis just as the US did in its uh, past history of, over the last few centuries? And so would you uh, still believe that this is a positive story of a crisis that needs to happen for Europe to integrate further? And uh, I would give you an example of that. Uh, it, it would have been inconceivable even a few months ago, thinking about what people now call a banking union, a common resolution fund, some level of common surveillance in the banking sector, and probably a, a common system of European banking guarantee. And yet, those are issues that are on the table, are being negotiated. People expect to see something on this uh, at the next European Council at the end of June. And so would you accept this parallel that Europe is growing uh, through the pains of crisis, the pains of history, just as the U.S. did over the last few centuries? Yes. Well, I think the real parallel is actually with Alexander Hamilton uh, um, after the uh, uh, War of Independence. 
when the individual states, which were only confederates, uh, engage, uh, uh, incurred very large debts which they couldn't pay. Uh, but uh, Hamilton persuaded them to band together and to accept a common responsibility for, for uh, that debt. And that was really uh, the, the creation of the, of the, Europe, of the, uh, of, of the United States of, 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 of uh, uh, America. And I, I, I would very much like to hope that something similar is going to happen. But I'm tremendously concerned uh, that uh, 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 the process is taking too long. And uh, the authorities are, in fact, discussing the, uh, the areas where they have to move in order to bring the uh, problem under control and to, to, re, re, uh, to uh, uh, change the trend. But they'll do the minimum where they, where they, really, ought to, where they really ought to be uh, doing the maximum. And, with, and uh, that is what they have been doing all along. If they had done anything, any of the things that they were willing to do a year later, the, 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 actually, the crisis could have been contained, but they didn't. And I think this is the last time, when the last opportunity. This is what the point that I, one of the points that I'm trying to stress: that there is still a window of opportunity to recognize the need for something extraordinary, something going for, ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. Uh, uh, because uh, th uh, three months from now, the situation will uh, deteriorate, and the willingness to, to take on additional responsibilities will diminish, whereas the need for doing it will still, still continue to grow. Thank you. Um, can I ask you something on, on a more personal note? Uh, we see the rise of populism in Europe. We have seen it in Greece, we have seen it in other countries, in France, in, in the, even in Italy. Um, and populists on the left and on the right have a common team in Europe right now. They, they go against financiers. They say banks, hedge funds. Uh, essentially, people like you are to blame for the current crisis. Your name uh, is in, in the memory of many in Britain and even in Italy as the person who, who played an important part in 1992 in the unraveling of the pound and of the lira. So some people consider you on the side of, of these people who are actually to blame for the crisis. On the other hand, uh, I see uh, your commitment, personal commitment, to solve this crisis intellectually, politically, and, and your charity, your commitment to, to a new economic thinking. So I'm, I'm trying to interpret what people have uh, in their minds, and I would ask you, are you good or evil? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not holier than thou, because that's a very difficult uh, 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 standard to live up to, but uh, I certainly have exactly because of my history uh, uh, and my childhood experiences. I am passionately uh, devoted to the European Union as a fantastic object, um, and and uh, I'm trying to help. Uh, to uh, bring this about. Uh, uh, now, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you mentioned uh, the um, uh, uh, rise of populism. And I have a lot of understanding and sympathy for pe people who are confused and angry. And I do blame the, the, the authorities, not for making mistakes, because we all make mistakes, uh, 
but for not recognizing their mistakes. When, when it's not only, uh, you know, outside observers like me who are uh, 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 talking about it, but the facts are showing that the policies that they are uh, advocating are, are not working. Uh, so I, I, I think the responsibility is with the, uh, with the, the primary responsibility is uh, with the authorities. Now, hedge funds and financial markets uh, can influence the course of events. What has really happened uh, by when the um, uh, member countries uh, transferred their right to print money uh, to the ECB uh, um, is that they became like third world countries that are not in control of the currency uh, in which, they have, uh, in which they, their debts are denominated and therefore they are subject to speculative attack. And, and you can't uh, 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 let's say, you can, you, you, can, you can blame the hedge funds for, for doing it, but realistically can't, you can't really expect them not to do it when they, have, when they see an opportunity uh, to make money because th their job is not to support the system uh, but to, but to uh, uh, make money. That's what, the, that's what their investors expect from them. That's their fiduciary duty in, in, in a sense. So uh, 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 but, uh, the authorities uh, uh, and the, the, uh, are sort of the deflecting blame uh, from themselves by blaming uh, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, hedge funds. But uh, uh, it's like shooting the messenger. But they are the people who, may, who create the message. So I would say that theirs is the primary responsibility. Thank you very much. We still have some time to take a few questions from the public. So whoever wants to ask a question, please raise his or her hand. Ci sono domande? Buonasera, Mr. Soros. Um, nel 1900... Good evening, Mr. Soros. Good evening, Mr. Soros. In uh, August 1998, I bought one of your books, uh, The Crisis of Global Capitalism. And two months later, there was the, uh, the situation of Russian default. These were terrible times. It seemed that the world was ending. But then there was a slight recovery, a slow recovery, and we moved from uh, uh, a depression to the 2000 technology bubble. The emotional impact of markets on uh, the people is so strong that volatility uh, becomes the very spirit with which we now speak to each other. It now seems that the year is over. You say that there's a three-month uh, window of opportunity. Um, That's a way of feeling a little bit less pessimistic. So basically, my question is, uh, do you think that the crisis will be over reasonably soon uh, within this three-month window of opportunity? Uh, I didn't, uh, couldn't hear the beginning of the question. But uh, um, the, to, uh, to answer the question, uh, unfortunately, I do not. Uh, this is why I'm uh, trying to uh, ring the alarm bell, that this is the last opportunity to get ahead of the curve and to uh, uh, bring about uh, or create a, a significant uh, 
uh, uh, institutional or structural uh, uh, reforms that will provide convincing evidence for the markets that the euro is here to stay. And I, in particular, I don't want to go into details because that would take another hour. Uh, uh, but uh, you need to create a financial authority, uh, a European financial authority, uh, which, because the, the owners of the, the European Central Bank, the, the member states, can do what the European Central Bank cannot do. Uh, they can extend, they can take over the, uh, the uh, 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 solvency risk that really does not, uh, should not uh, uh, be uh, uh, at the risk of the U European Central Bank. And if they created a European financial authority, uh, 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 then the solvency risk would practically disappear. So, so by doing it, they would actually, the member states and Germany, led by Germany, would actually eliminate all the risks that they are currently so afraid of. That's what is needed. Buongiorno. Good morning. Are you optimistic uh, about uh, the Italian government, the future of Italy guided by Professor Monti? Now it's late. Sorry. Are you optimistic about the future of Italy that is now, the, go the government is now led yes. by Mario Monti? Uh, look, I, I think that, that uh, the, the Monti government has uh, uh, embarked on a po policy that was very promising. And it also had considerable support from the public. Uh, but it also needs support uh, from the European community because without it, no progress can be made and uh, the, uh, the public support ev evaporates, which makes it more difficult for him to carry out the program. So, uh, he, he embarked on uh, structural reforms, and those are necessary, uh, but not sufficient. Uh, you also need structural reforms in the euro, because th that's, what's, that's, uh, that's where there are some very serious flaws. And if the European Union, uh, the, um, or the euro countries, don't make those moves, the Monti government alone will lose momentum and will not be able to carry out the reforms in which it, on which it is currently uh, uh, embarked. And already the, the labor market reforms have been considerably diluted. If there were a European financial authority, let's say that would take over uh, 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 the, uh, much of the solvency risk in Italian bonds. So Italy could uh, uh, refinance its debt uh, at a rate which is closer to what, uh, let's say, Germany is paying. Um, uh, 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 then uh, Monti could, uh, could actually carry out those reforms. Penso che abbiamo uh, tempo solo per una ultimissima. I think we have time for perhaps one more question. You said that uh, austerity policies are just uh, the wrong way to go, the wrong way of uh, trying to solve the crisis of sovereign debts. Uh, Krugman yesterday on the New York Times said that this is simply an attempt of the conservative elites to destroy entirely the European welfare state. Would you? Agree on that? They 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 say that the crisis is just an excuse. Whether you agree with speak up, whether, whether please, agree. please speak up because I can't. The question is whether you agree with Mr. Krugman that says that austerity policies are uh, an extreme attempt by conservatives 
uh, to destroy the welfare state in Europe and not a way to save the system, to make the system safer and sounder? Uh, no, I don't think that, uh, that, uh, uh, that I agree with that because I think structural reforms are in fact necessary uh, individu in individual countries uh, uh, because conditions have deteriorated and the welfare state cannot be maintained quite in the, in the form in which it, it was uh, uh, flourishing. Uh, in past years. So there has to be uh, some uh, fiscal uh, constraints. Uh, uh, but they are not, uh, uh, they are necessary uh, but not uh, sufficient. And you need a, uh, it needs to be coupled. I mean, you could, you can, you could live with the fiscal compact. If it was uh, 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 coupled with a, a growth compact, that would actually be uh, 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 substantial enough uh, to regenerate growth, uh, because then you could grow your way out of, of the debt problem. So that is the, the missing link, and without it, the, uh, the efforts at uh, 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 structural reforms within individual countries are going to run out of steam. Mr. Soros, thank you very, very much for this. It was extremely interesting and people, I think, uh, followed with great deal of attention. So we thank you for this and I, I think uh, in case, uh, we, maybe if we have time for a very last question, I would ask you, uh, I would take advantage of my role for uh, asking you this question, and it's about Germany. Is it's, it is about Germany. Uh, Germany reversed uh, its uh, historical position about Europe. It was very much in favor of political integration of a European federation uh, at the time of Maastricht, and then France stopped it and probably the French regret it very much today. They would like to have had this federation now. Today, the Germans seem to be uh, the least keen in Europe to further political integration. At least this is the perception people have in Southern Europe and also in France. How would you explain this uh, incredible shift? Well, I actually tried to explain it in my in, in my uh, uh, speech uh, that, or my, uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, up to the German unification, Germany was in the forefront of integration. Uh, now they have taken the cost of uh, German reunification and they don't want to become the deep pocket uh, for, the, uh, for the rest of Europe. Uh, and I can sympathize with that uh, position, but uh, uh, they have to, they have to uh, find a way to reward the countries that are ready to, uh, to abide by the fiscal compact and introduce structural reforms by giving them some concessions, some guarantees, uh, and uh, they could deal with the moral hazard then, because withdrawing those guarantees would be a, a very potent uh, punishment that would stop an, uh, any country from doing it. So that, that could work where you would have a certain symmetry between uh, uh, let's say, uh, incentives or guarantees that would come first and, and punishments or withdrawal of guarantees that would uh, come afterwards. That would uh, uh, stop the fiscal compact from pushing uh, Europe into this deflationary uh, spiral. Uh, 
uh, it requires some imagination, uh, but I, I'm convinced that that would work. Uh, so I just hope that, that um, uh, Germany will actually see it. But uh, uh, the reason that I'm sort of uh, arguing uh, publicly uh, is because I just come from Germany and I see no signs of this happening in Germany. And that, that's why I'm ringing the, the alarm bell. Thank you very much.